This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus, episode 728. This week, we welcome Brad Prezant and Russ Crutcher. We're going to talk about assessing wildfire and other indoor particles. There's been a lot of attention on fire restoration and how to determine what is contaminated versus what is clean. And today we'll learn more on IAQ Radio Plus. But before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. And don't forget, after the show, you got you can continue the discussion on afterthoughts.iaqradio.com. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, at IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, RIA, at RestorationIndustry.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA, at EIA-USA.org. IAQ Radio industry sponsors are Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com, BioPlanet at BYOPlanet.com, Actionable Insights at GetInsights.org. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio trivia question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to John Long, John Long's Cleaning in Bel Air, Ohio, who was first to identify the four routes of chemical exposure as inhalation, absorption, injection, and ingestion. Here's today's IAQ Radio Plus trivia question. Name the term defined as the line, area, or zone where structures and other human development meet or intermingle with underdeveloped wildland or vegetable fuels. Back to you, Joe. Okay, so Brad Prezant is an evidence-based public health scientist with a background in epidemiology, occupational health and hygiene, and ergonomics. He provides expert witness support for litigation involving indoor air quality, including mold, wildfires, and other issues impacting the built environment. Until the company was sold in 2007, he operated Prezant Associates, Inc., in Seattle, providing consulting, training, and laboratory services for 20-plus years. He is currently principal consultant at Prezant Environmental in Melbourne, Australia. Russ Crutcher is the owner and principal analyst for Microlab Northwest since 1978. Mr. Crutcher graduated from the University of Washington and also went to graduate school in civil engineering. He's taught classes in environmental microscopy since 1976. He's vast experience in microscopy and identifying contaminants and their sources, including on surfaces of satellites returned from orbits. Mr. Crutcher has published over 100 papers on the analysis of environmental particles using light microscopy. Welcome to both of you today. Welcome back, Brad, and welcome for the first time, Russ. Uh, the idea for this show started with some posts on the AIHA forum on wildfire sampling. We want to get to that, but let's start by having Russ tell our audience a little bit about himself and the types of projects he does. Russ? Well, basically... I analyze particles in various environments. Uh, I work on failure analysis for equipment, particles that are generated by failure. I work on particles, uh, as uh, uh, Cliff mentioned, particles on satellites returned from orbit, as well as the satellites before they're launched. I've done a lot of work on uh, Electrical Power Research Institute, looking at uh, failures in transformers, looking at uh, fire debris since, oh golly, 74. I did a lot of work on uh, emissions from uh, teepee burners from the l lumber industry. Uh, so it's um, I've been working with fire residues for a long time. Russ, when you, uh, when you say looking at, let's give a little little more uh, detail on, on the type of microscopy you do. 
Well, uh, a lot of what I do involves the physics of light matter interaction. Uh, looking at a particle, uh, you know, anyone can look down through the eyepieces of a microscope and say, I see a particle down there. Uh, they might be able to say, well, that particle is opaque. It doesn't allow light to come through it. Uh, that's kind of trivial. There's a lot of additional information. The morphology of the particle uh, tells you something about its uh, uh, condition prior to becoming a particle. It uh, tells you about how it became a particle. It tells you uh, what the optical properties are in terms of how much light does it transmit, how much light does it reflect, how does it behave in polarized light, uh, how does it behave in dark field illumination. All of these different types of things tell you more about the chemistry and the physics of the particle. So a particle contains a lot of information about its history, its transport mechanism, uh, how long it's been in a particular location. Uh, and then there's a lot of information in regard to its potential hazard to uh, individuals. Now, a lot of what I work on are uh, health complaints, not long-term things, but things where, uh, for instance, someone goes into an office environment and after they've been there about 15, 20 minutes, they begin to notice uh, respiratory effects. Uh, those are things that indicate uh, a rapid response to something in the environment. Uh, that's different than something that might cause cancer 20 years down line. You know, if you're exposed to asbestos, you don't really notice right away that you've had an exposure. Uh, much of what I do is identifying the things that cause people discomfort. And uh, the discomfort can be either health or it can be soiling. Uh, you know, when I put my white shirt on the tabletop, it comes away dark. Okay, so what is it that's contaminating it? Or someone's moved into a new apartment and they've noticed all kinds of white dust on surfaces. What is the white dust and where does it come from? Uh, those are some of the things I, I work on. We've had things where uh, pets have gotten ill in an environment. Humans not, but the pets have. Uh, so what is it that's in the environment that a pet is more sensitive to than a human being? Um, all kinds of things that, that we work on. I, I recently wrote a series of papers on... Uh, 48 of the optical properties of particles and how you measure them and uh, briefly what they may mean. I've got to write another series on, on uh, what those things actually tell you about the history of the particle. And Russ, is this primarily through the light microscope or are you also, do you have an SEM or you know scanning electron microscope? Do you use transmission electron microscopy? Um, or is this I primarily... have, I have, but I, I uh, my lab right now is primarily light microscopy. I don't have an SEM. I don't have a, a TEM. Most of the things that uh, affect people short term are fairly large. Uh, by large, I mean a micron or more. And uh, uh, those things can tell you a lot about the environment. Gotcha. Don't need an SEM to do that. Brad, let's get you welcome back. Brad, always great to have you here. Thank uh, you so much, um, Joe and Cliff. <clears throat> Russ, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Russ and I go back to the late 70s, early 80s. And I was at the time working at the University of Washington as a consultant. I was doing indoor air quality assessments and very often I would come up against problems that I really uh, had difficulty understanding what the cause was. Uh, Russ had this amazing background in particle analysis, and I began to realize that he could be an incredibly helpful person in trying to understand what's going on with a number of the problems that my clients were coming to me with and saying, hey, we have an indoor air quality problem, can you help us? So I'll, I'll give you some examples. So I had an insurance company come to me once. The adjuster said, listen, I got this problem. 
these people got a new furnace and they live in this tiny little house and there's five of them sitting around the table smoking, chain smoking, and they have this brown deposition on the walls. And I think this is ridiculous, but I really need you to go out and tell me what's going on, okay? So I go out, I talk to these people and they say, well, you know, yeah, we, we, we smoke a lot of cigarettes around the kitchen table and it is a tiny house, but we've been doing this for years and only since this new furnace was installed have we had a problem. So using the techniques that Russ has pioneered uh, and that you could see on his website, I took uh, tape samples with a special tape, 3M Agitape. Uh, Russ processes them in a certain way to create a very high resolution image. And uh, from the glass surfaces and the paintings on the wall and that sort of thing, I took these samples and Russ looked at them and he said, this is not cigarette smoke deposition. He said, this is high molecular weight grease that's depositing on these surfaces. Uh, take a look at that furnace and see if someone dropped a blob of grease right near the outlet or something to that effect. And sure enough, that's exactly what the problem was. Uh, without Russ's support, it would have been really difficult or impossible to solve that problem. I'll give you another quick example. Um, downtown Seattle, uh, a building that uh, was built uh, that was probably at least 150 feet taller than the adjacent building. And at the time, mesquite grills and mesquite uh, chicken broilers and mesquite this. And I think they must have had four different mesquite appliances they put in with really excellent ventilation up to the roof where it was released into the environment, right? This adjacent building, maybe with an air intake 150 feet below, starts complaining about mesquite odors. And as an occupational hygienist, I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to measure here? Am I going to measure carbon monoxide? Am I going to measure some chemical emission? You know, how am I going to tie their complaints to the emissions from this new installation, which for all practical purposes should be going up and, and not down 150 feet. So I took samples in the, using the same techniques, uh, submitted them to Russ, and he said, well, yeah, absolutely. He said, I could see mesquite uh, char here. It has the characteristics of mesquite. It's not uh, ash or maple or alder or any of the other woods we burn. It's absolutely mesquite based upon the structure of the of the cells, you know. And of course, what was going on in this urban environment was with the air coming in at different angles and lots of buildings and this and that, there was this downflow of air directly into the intake for this other building. So th those are just two really quick examples of how the types of analyses that Russ is able to do have, for me, you know, in many ways, I've always thought of him as a, as a not so secret weapon in terms of solving these <laughs> indoor air quality kinds of problems that I've been dealing with for many, many decades. Um, you know, I could, I, could, I could go on and on and on and on. You know, we had one recently where uh, a smoker that was burning this German wood, uh, special chips from the Black Forest in Germany was contaminated by a structural or potentially contaminated by a structural fire in the building where it was sitting on the loading dock. And there would have been probably three or four weeks of business interruption if that had to be cleaned, the interior had to be cleaned. And uh, by taking samples within the structural fire area and then taking samples within this shipping container that was used for smoking meats, we were able to definitively say that there was no structural fire residue in there. And the insurance company saved four or five weeks of several tens of thousands of dollars of business interruption. So, you know, the power, I think, of light microscopy, probably the least sexy of all microscopic techniques you can imagine, um, is just remarkable. And, you know, Russ has helped me over these many decades in a number of areas. Uh, so I think that the power of light microscopy is vastly underestimated. You know, Russ is very modest. He's not going to tell you all about the things he's helped with, but you know, I'm not the only person he's helped. And it's remarkable the way that this can be a tool for occupational hygienists and others using light microscopy to understand what's going on with the particulate fraction and sometimes even the condensed uh, SVOC fraction of, of contaminants that might be present indoors. So the whole thing for, for wildfires for us was just a natural evolution from this work that we've been doing with particulate analysis, whether it be fibrous glass or 
or condensed uh, high molecular weight uh, greases or this or that or whatever. Um, all of that is just really an evolution from this technique and this approach. You know, and I just wanted to verify if I'm correct. With light microscopy, the cost isn't outrageous like it is with, you know, sometimes SEM or TEM we were talking about earlier in the show. Is that accurate to say, Russ? Uh, yeah, I think it is. What yeah, are we so talking about to, to analyze for a, you know, for a soot or, or something like that? Ballpark. Well, uh, around $400 for 10 samples. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So we're looking at maybe 40 bucks a sample. All right, Cliff, let me turn it over to you. I know you've got uh, a lot on your mind. Well, no, I I think, you know, just kind of following up, uh, Russ, does it matter what you're looking at uh, or some samples take more time to analyze and would be more than the $40 or if they kind of are, are in that range? Yeah. Yeah, there is, some of them are more expensive. Like, for instance, when you're working with a structural fire, uh, that's more difficult. Uh, there are so many different types of structural fires. You know, you, you can have an attic fire where the primary fuel is uh, structural wood, or you can have a kitchen fire. You can have a uh, dryer fire. You can have a garage fire. You can have an oily rag fire. Uh, structure fires tend to be so different than wildfire. Wildfire really is fairly easy to identify because uh, of the characteristic plants that are burning and the parts of the plants that burn. I uh, want to show that real Go ahead. I don't know. I, I guess the other follow-up I had is one of the things that someone said, I, I think Brad said it, if, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the things that he's also uh, successfully worked with you on is uh you know condensed particles you know and i and i'm just wondering if something like a a protein what we call a protein fire when you know a, a turkey burns and there's nothing nothing left and you have 18 pounds of uh turkey residue evenly distributed uh, okay. over the home does that stuff come off uh pretty easy with uh with tape samples and, and you can still see it yeah it quite often will yeah oh, cool good to know thank you I got you know, there's there's something about the methodology in the tape sampling. All tape sampling is not made equal. So Russ has pioneered a, a technique where using uh, Scotch 3M Magit tape, when you take the tape sample, you put it in a, a Ziploc bag, he gets it in the lab, he puts it on a slide, and then the, I, I should let you explain this, but, and then the slide goes into an acetone bath and the acetate backing uh, is dissolved oh. away but the adhesive is insoluble in the solvent. So what you end up with when you dry the slide is a mount that consists of the adhesive uh, sandwiching the particulate to the glass. And then if you add a, uh, a refractive index uh, fixative to that, that has the same optical properties, the same index of refraction, then you end up with this fabulously clear view. I should I should turn it over to you, Russ, because this well, is I, I went onto the web website and you know I was just surprised because you know in the past I was always told to use crystal tape and so on and so forth and you know he has a very nice video on there that it explains step by step and I guess it's your hands they're doing it, Russ, or uh, <laughs> you know it, you know it, in the video yeah. so you know it you know it's really really good instructions and. Um, so it would it wouldn't matter you'd use that if it was a a, a greasy grease fire residue you you kind of use the same thing where you kind of press on it with your hand yeah yeah it it goes into the adhesive and so there's residue there that you can characterize one of, one of the nice things about this technique is you end up with a permanent mount so i have samples that go back into the 70s and uh, if I want to go back and, and check an analysis that I did in the 70s or pull a sample that I did in the 70s to uh, use as a standard, I can do that. Uh, most people using clear tape, uh, they dispose of the tape right after they analyze it because they destroy it in the type of analysis they do. Um, if I could share my screen for a second here, can you see this? Uh 
choosing the correct tape methodology slide. Is that showing there? Yeah. Russ, do you want to talk about this just in terms of the resolution that you're getting from the technique here? Well, basically, this is just a, uh, an example of uh, a, a laser pointer. Uh, well, a laser, low power laser. Going through a uh, uh, simply a straight path toward a target. That's what's on the extreme left. And then going through a uh, uh, piece of clear, what's called clear tape. And then finally going through a piece of 3M magic tape that has been cleared and mounted. Uh, you can see a number of things there. The, the amount of light scatter that's created in the final mount with 3M tape is uh, very much reduced, not too much more than than uh, the scatter with nothing in the pattern. But with clear tape, you get quite a bit of additional scatter, and that's just uh, clouding the image. When you're using clear tape, uh, they don't manufacture clear tape to be uh, a high optical quality, because that's not what they're trying to do. Uh, you have a problem with the clear tape when you try and put it on a slide. Uh, it quite often traps air bubbles around particles, mm -hmm. which makes it even harder to characterize the particle. So what a lot of people do is they'll put down immersion oil and then set the tape down on the immersion oil. Well, as soon as you've done that, you no longer have a permanent sample because the immersion oil is is simply oil. And uh, so that that you end up disposing of the slide when you're done. The plastic layer also can have a number of defects in it. And uh, those defects also uh, cloud the image a bit. Oh, God. Did, you, did you invent this technique or adapt it? it? it no, nah, this, is, this has been around since the 1930s. Uh, it was used by some uh, uh, forensic analysts back in the in the 1930s. Uh, I ran across it when I was doing some research at the University of Washington in the early 60s. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't copy that paper. I was mm -hmm. an undergraduate at that time and <laughs> didn't know I was going to need it. But uh, what they had done was they were using a cellophane tape. So it's a uh, cellulose acetate tape and they had an acrylic adhesive on it and they were picking up particles and putting them down on slides, processing them with acetone, mounting them and then analyzing them. And uh, so uh, that was a pretty slick technique. And so I looked for a tape that would do that. And the only tape that I found that would do that was a 3M uh, magic tape, cellulose ester with an acrylic adhesive. Hmm. And I've been using that for, oh golly, since uh, at least 1970. So this process is not widely used by other labs? It's, uh, it's not, um, but uh, I've got a paper coming out here shortly. Uh, talking about this technique and and why people might be interested in using it, um, the uh, the number of people who do high quality microscopy is probably much higher in Europe than it is here. Uh, we like to buy big, expensive pieces of equipment. I mean, let me ask a question. I got several texts, but. Um... I think this is for Brad. How did you differentiate fire residue from meat smoking residue? Well, you know, this really ties into what Russ has just been talking about. So when you when you use the technique we've been discussing and you make a preparation, you've got a really high resolution view of all the different particles. 
And if you can use a variety of modalities, uh, switching between transmitted and reflected light, dark field, light field, polarized, non-polarized, and I'm, I'm not going to get into it because I'm sure Russ could explain it much better than me. But using all these different techniques, you could learn a tremendous amount about the particles that are present. And you learn things that you wouldn't be able to learn using SEM or TEM or other techniques. In a way, that's really the power of this high resolution mount combined with the knowledge and experience of the person doing the analysis. Yeah. So a lot of this is really about Russ's experience and and his ability to look at these slides and discern all these different particles and identify what they are and or where they come from. So Sorry. when we start talking about bushfires, wildfires, you know, I live in Australia now, so we, we're the, the bushfires, um, being able to see all these different particles in high resolution is what's going to enable the microscopist to distinguish between all the products of a structural fire all the things that are con contained in wildfire smoke as it goes downwind 10, 15, 20 kilometers, whatever. Uh, all of that information is there if you can access it and you can interpret it and you know how to derive that from the various modalities of light microscopy. So that's really the value of where this all comes together and merges into, you know, how do we look at a building that's possibly be in been impacted by wildfire smoke and distinguish the deposited particulate from what might have occurred from 20 or 30 other ways that little black particles might arise or this or that or any of these other modalities that are used that don't are, are not capable of distinguishing between these different sources of combustion particulate. So the value here is to be able to understand all these different little particles that are associated with uh, a wildfire that don't show up, for example, in a structural fire. And, you know, Russ can get into the details of all, what those are. They're traces of, of the things that have burnt, you know, the bark, the twigs, and the leaves are going to show different traces than what the solid wood would be. So if you had a fireplace backing up, the deposition within the home from the fireplace or a burn pit outside or a turkey or whatever else might have created combustion particulate can be differentiated for this type of work. And for me, this is the value of the the, the services that, that Russ and Microlab Northwest offer because I need to be able to say definitively as a, as a consultant being brought in by the insurance company or the homeowner, that this is not just some type of combustion particulate that might be sourced from any one of 20 different sources. This is specific to a wildfire, and not only can it be associated with that particular wildfire, because if you know what plants burned, there's gonna be tra traces of these materials that are consistent with the species of wood that have burned. You know, I'm, I'm gonna let Russ get into all the, the detail on that, but to me, that's amazing and remarkable. And it's the kind of information that if I'm gonna go into court as an expert witness, that's the kind of information I wanna have, not generic information about black particles that can be from toner or mascara or some other burn event that has nothing to do with the with the wildfire. All right. Uh, let's stop here. We're going to thank our sponsors. We're going to go to halftime. When we come back, I've got a question about the recommendation on the AIHA website for this type of, for some type of sampling. It seems to me now that I'm, I'm even a little more concerned about it, but let's get to our sponsors. And then we'll be back with uh, Russ Crutcher and Brad Prezant in 30 seconds. Association sponsors are AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA's multidisciplinary membership, collects, generates, and disseminates information concerning environmental and occupational health hazards in the built environment at eia-usa.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, iicrc.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the oldest and largest nonprofit professional trade association dedicated to providing leadership and promoting best practices through advocacy, 
standards, and professional qualifications for the restoration industry at restorationindustry.org. Actionable insights, no more mistakes, no more missed line items in your Xactimate estimates at getinsights.org. Industry sponsors are Particles Plus. Feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us, particlesplus.com. BioPlanet at byoplanet.com. Improving human, animal, and environmental health with electrostatic spray technology and advanced chemistries at biobyoplanet.com. Actionable insights at getinsights.org. We are back with the second half of our show. We've got Brad Prezant and Russ Crutcher. And I want to read, this was um, what got this whole thing started was a, a, a publication or on the on the AIHA website that said residents returning home to pick up their lives must have their property tested and evaluated by a certified professional to ensure it's completely safe through sampling and data interpretation to begin recovery efforts. And, and what I'm hearing here today is not many people do the type of testing, first of all, that Russ and his group do. There are several different ways that people test and analyze for fire residue after projects. And even if we could agree on the right way of doing it, there aren't enough microscopists trained at this point to handle all this type of sampling and analysis. What am I missing here? Well, I, uh, I would agree with you. Uh, you know, this, this level of activity is not of any value if only one person in the world can do it. So we need a, a number of people who can do this kind of work. And so uh, one of the things I, I was asked by Macron Research Institute to put together a class to train people to identify uh, particles of combustion and their source. And so I'm uh, in the process of putting that together. I had to modify their scopes because their scopes weren't really capable of it. Uh, so I've got that pretty much set now. We'll start teaching classes. Uh, these are week-long intensive classes. And the way I'm actually designing it is that, uh, you know, you, you don't have to identify the species of tree that burned. Uh, that would require way too much training. But you do need to be able to identify uh, combustion products from grasses, say. Nobody burns grass in their fireplace. Uh, they don't burn grass in their fire pit in the backyard. But a lot of wildfires uh, have a heavy component from invasive grasses. You know, there are a lot of papers that have been published recently on the invasive grass problem in California that is leading to a lot of these fires. Uh, the same thing in uh, uh, the fire in Hawaii, Lahaina. That was uh, bull grass which is an invasive grass, burns very rapidly. The fire moved rapidly downhill because of the wind direction and came into the city before people had an opportunity to evacuate. Uh, there are a number of other areas, like uh, fountain grass is an issue on the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, bull grass is a problem in Kauai. Uh, here in... Uh, uh, Northwestern United States, cheat, an invasive grass, is one of the main sources of uh, fires in the Savannah area. Uh, so grasses, uh, if you can identify grasses, the char from grass, you've probably identified debris from a wildfire. And so that's one of the things that I'll be stressing in these early classes, just, you know, characterize the type of plant. Uh, you don't have to identify a plant in particular. And there are a number of uh, plants that can be characterized fairly easily if you have your microscope set up correctly. And uh, most labs don't. 
So that's one of the things we'll be going over. How do you set up your microscope to do this kind of work? And uh, then showing them just a, a few of the quick things that you can uh, use to distinguish wildfire from, uh, say, a fireplace. Like, you know, you, you talk about a backdraft in a fireplace. Well, people, when they're burning wood in their fireplace, the product that they're burning is wood. Wood is not the major fuel for most wildfires. Uh, like, for instance, I was doing uh, some work on an entirely different case in Colorado on uh, cement contamination. And one of the things we found in those samples was the uh, samples that I received were heavily contaminated with charred wood. Well, that charred wood's coming from fireplaces. Uh, in this particular environment, during the winter, there's a tremendous amount of wood burning for heat and, and uh, uh, you know, just ambience. So uh, charred wood becomes a major contaminant in that environment. And, uh, uh, you know, to recognize the fact that if you're looking at charred wood and you're not seeing charred grass and you're not seeing debris from leaves, you don't have a wildfire. Something else is burning. Interesting. Uh, when you talk about structure fires, uh, a lot of the uh, primary wood used in structures in this country is Douglas fir. Douglas fir has some very easily visible characteristics that will identify it as Douglas fir. And just knowing that, you don't have to know uh, how to identify all these other trees. But being able to just quickly look at a sample and say, oh, that's Douglas fir, gives you an important piece of information, and that's easy. So there are a lot of things that people can be trained to do that will help them do this work without having some extensive amount of, of training. They need to know how, they, how to use their microscope. And they need to know what to look for. Once they've done that, uh, they're on their way. They can, they can continue to sharpen their skill. But there are some easy things to start with. Brad, let, let's go to you for a second. I want to get your thoughts on that statement in the, in the document on the AIHA website that they must have their properly tested and yeah. evaluated. What are your thoughts on that? It seems like we're not there yet. Yeah, I, I don't think it was really a well-considered statement in the sense that when we talk about uh, fire and wildfire and structural fires, the range of, of uh, impact is, is tremendous. There are plenty of situations where your visual observations are going to tell you all that you need to know. Um, a lot of the techniques that Russ is talking about are really when you have ambiguous situations that are not immediately visibly obvious. Uh, so, so for me, these techniques are useful when there's ambiguity, but if your eyes and nose and your initial inspection are telling you everything you need to know, you really don't need to engage in a massive amount of exercise here to, to prove what's very obvious. Uh, in addition to which, I think there's been somewhat of an overemphasis on the potential health concerns associated with, with wildfire ash downwind. Now, I say that in the context of time and distance and uh, exposure metrics like dose and response, okay? So there's absolutely no question that wildfires have an enormous health impact particularly in, in regard to their PM 2.5 impact. Uh, and there's no question that if you have a fire like at Fort McMurray, for example, in Canada back in 16 or so, and you know a large number of homes burn, the ash is gonna contain large amounts of copper, chromium, and arsenic because that's what we treat uh, wood with. And arsenic is extremely toxic. It's more toxic than lead has a lower acceptable limit for, for uh, exposure. So all of these things are genuine health concerns. But when you start talking about uh, homes that are very far downwind and have been minimally impacted and are not visually contaminated, uh, to say that something like that must be evaluated, again, you know, you have this wide spectrum. There are times when an evaluation is appropriate, but there's certainly times when you don't really need to do it. 
So, so my opinion is that that's really a bit of an exaggeration in terms of what's really needed. And it's a common sense approach when, when your eyes and your nose are telling you there's a, a problem with a, a structural fire or a wildfire or whatever, that's going to be sufficient. So, so must in all cases, I don't think that would have been the intent of, of AIHA to recommend. And that's, that's perhaps my opinion. Um, but, but I think that there's, uh, there has to be some judgment here involved. I mean, if a professional is getting involved, then there's a reason for that. Questions are being asked. We're going to design a sampling plan that's going to answer those questions, and it might involve microscopic techniques and other techniques or whatever. But that's not that's not going to happen 100% of the time, or it doesn't need to happen 100% of the time. You know, one of the big concerns uh, from restores is they went through what happened with mold. And, uh, you know, when we go back at the beginning of mold, it was sample, sample, sample. If there was one uh, spore of stachybotrys that showed up, you failed clearance, you had to go back. And, you know, they didn't necessarily know that that spore could have been walked in rather than, you know, was, was still in the environment. And, and they saw much of the insurance coverage is being reduced. You know, uh, both Allstate and State Farm have pulled out of California based on on wildfires. And if, you know, and I think if, and I, I think what the AIHA document was talking about or statement was talking about wasn't the type of sampling that Russ was doing. I think it was chemical sampling. And I think maybe even real time, uh, mass spec, uh, GC, stuff like that. And when I looked at the documents and the research, whether it was from Fort McMurray or whether it was the Colorado wildfires, what the data said was how effective cleaning was, you know, good cleaning and removing it. And that physical cleaning was more effective than air cleaners and, 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 and so on and so forth. And that's really what the restoration industry is all about is cleaning it. And, you know, deep cleaning or clean it first. And if there's a problem, you know, then investigate. But and I, I think one of the things that you said very eloquently is, you know, when we walk in, it's different than a wildfire. I think sometimes wildfires have, you know, what I've recently coined as underwhelming evidence. You know, you can't necessarily see it. You can't necessarily smell it. The only way we're going to be able to, to tell is to use microscopy and, and Russ's process because, you know, it's not necessarily going to show up effectively with wiping and so on and so forth. You may not necessarily see, uh, you know, the color diff differences that, that that one might expect. But to to be able to walk into a fire where you can see the source of the fire, where you can see the damage of the fire, where you can see the heat damage, you can see the impact, you can see the particles in many situations, you know, that have settled out. And to say that that is not confirmation, that you have to look at it under a microscope when, you, you know, you have this overwhelming amount of information that, yeah, this, this is a fire. You know, these people didn't write with mascara all over their houses and then turn in an insurance claim. You know, I just, I, I think that's where it gets a little uh, out of control. Yeah, I mean, sampling should be a hypothesis testing exercise. You develop a hypothesis, you develop a sampling plan to answer the hypothesis. And, and rule number one is you have to be able to interpret the data that you get from the sampling. If you can't interpret the data, <clears throat> then it's ridiculous to be doing sampling. And, you know, I think that's something that I see among less experienced hygienists where they just do sampling and then they're looking at the, at the results and they're saying, you know what? How do I interpret this? It's like you shouldn't be doing the sampling unless you have the interpretive criteria, uh, you know, to to make sense of it. And there's a context to it. You know, I, I for example, I do particulate sampling if I'm looking at an issue of a structural fire or, or a, a wildfire, bushfire impact. I don't sample for SVOCs or other compounds. Okay, so I don't think I can properly interpret any SVOC data that I'm going to get. Uh, I know that from the, the studies that were done at University of Toronto looking at the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that the levels will lower in the homes in Fort McMurray than in Ottawa. So, I mean, yes, you're going to maybe get some elevation of these things, 
and probably some aldehydes as well. But how do you interpret that? You know, if there's a slight elevation in, in benzaldehyde or something else like that in the home, is there any health significance to that? Do we have any metric to compare it to? How do you interpret that? I think that's a big problem. And if you're going to do sampling, it needs to be part of this hypothesis process and then have some type of appropriate interpretive criteria, not just an exercise in, in exploring. You know, I'm, I'm curious, Russ, do you have any um, guideline, you know, internal guideline or, or guideline you use with your clients as to when sampling shows that the area is clean enough? Well, we can determine whether or not it's uh, clean down to background levels. But, uh, you know, one of the one of the problems that a lot of people don't consider is that if you've been exposed to a wildfire and the wildfire was was nearby ash and and combustion debris is now part of your background environment and you'll track that into the house one of the problems we see occasionally is where a house has been remediated and then three months later, somebody comes in and says, well, we need to sample this to make sure it was cleaned adequately. And you look at the sample and sure enough, there's debris from the wildfire in this home. Well, you know, there's going to be some. The, the environment has not been purged of all debris from that wildfire. And so, you know, you're going to carry some of it in. If you want to confirm that a remediation was completed adequately, you need to test shortly after the remediation. You don't want to wait. And uh, so those are those are some considerations. Now, the the scale that I typically use is is a log scale in terms of exposure. And so if I'm finding something in in uh, you know very low levels. We're talking about, you know, what you might expect in a home from the neighbor's fireplace. Right. Uh, that, that, you know, it may be, I may be able to say, well, this is from the wildfire. But it's about at the same level as the guy, you know, the guy's fireplace next door polluting your home. Uh, I wouldn't say that requires remediation. And... Uh, but we can see it's there. Uh, right. You know, the next step up, when you start getting, say, 10 times more than, than what you would expect in a uh, an environment like that, then that may be a level where you, you want to do some remediation. And uh, certainly, if you continue up the scale, it'll become pretty obvious. Brad, do you want to follow up on that? You mentioned that there, there's a four category scale. Yeah, I think um, the whole concept of assemblage analysis, you know, we have 10 minutes left. I, I don't know that we could really get into a, a full characterization of it, but basically the approach, there's, there's multiple approaches you can take. The one that's been most commonly uh, taken is like a Suchar and ash analysis where you're looking and counting the number of particles. But there's a lot of problems with that not least of which is that an individual trying to uh, estimate the percentage coverage is a very difficult and uh, not consistent exercise from one analyst to another, one lab to another. But the, the protocols that Russ has developed in terms of applying assemblage analysis are much more reliable in terms of understanding these markers of uh, either wildfire or structural fire impact that you're seeing on the slides under the microscope. So I think, you know, I know, Russ, you have a number of papers on this. Perhaps uh, we could put them on the website and people could read them and understand how assemblage works. I mentioned that uh, basically it's, it's a technique where you're trying to determine how many different fields of view in the microscope it takes to see the assemblage of materials, including all the different factors, you know, whether it be the calcium oxalate crystals in the in the plants, the phytoliths, or whether it be um, the material that was dropped 
on the fire as a fire retardant or whatever, all these little different clues that tell you that this is associated with a wildfire. Assemblage analysis is a process where you're seeing how long and how many fields it takes to identify that. And I mentioned on the on the discussion that there are four categories of, of impact. Um, but I think we don't have time to go into the, the details now, but perhaps posting all of the papers, Russ, uh, would be very useful to people. And we could put them in Cliff's blog as well. Um, Brad, I want to ask a question that Cliff had put together here of, of you. And then, Cliff, I want to give you a chance to jump in. But um, in wildfire scenarios, are you concerned about fire-related particles trapped within the building envelope? I, we're talking about the wildfire versus structural fire inside the building envelope. That's correct. Wildfire particles, yes. Be yeah, because you've got really different physics operating here. You know, when you have a structural fire, you have massive heat, you have pressure. Uh, you're going to force air into, uh, you know, wall cavities and the like. Uh, and of course, probably all of us who've worked with this have seen situations where contamination exists in the wall cavity because of that pressure and air movement. And you can clean the uh, you can clean the accessible portions of the building, and an odor is going to remain. And the contractor ends up ripping off the plasterboard, uh, the sheetrock, because those areas need to be cleaned as well. So, I mean, you can have that in a structural fire, but I don't think you're, you, you have anywhere near the same physics operating when you have uh, air movement in and out of wall cavities that's not driven by heat and pressure. So when we're talking about wildfires, you're not going to get a, a rate of infiltration to the wall cavity that's anywhere near, you know, that's orders of magnitude less than what you get from the heat and pressure of a fire. So the potential for contamination is is way, way lower in that situation. So you don't think wind could uh, you know, push it in, you know, uh, homes that might have aluminum siding and, you know, so on and so forth? No, I, I'm just... I mean, you know, right. there, there are going to be exceptions to any and all situations, but, you know, the pressure that's developed in a fire, I would say, has to be orders of magnitude higher than, you know, the five or six pascals on the on the side of the building from wind. No, I don't, I don't, dis I don't disagree with you. It's just that, that if people are worried about this wildfire contamination being a health hazard inside, you know, inside the building, how did, you know, how did it get inside the building? In some situations, there's a direct hole where it can come in and others, in other situations that, that those particles have to pass through, uh, you know, some barriers or obstructions or change direction and so on and so forth in order to get in. Yes or no? Well, I mean, you're dealing with two different things here. I mean, one, you are getting movement of air and particle penetration through a building envelope. Uh, that for sure is happening. There's, uh, based upon the size of the of the particle, you're going to get a filtering effect as the air moves through with the smaller particles. Uh, you know, right. maybe there's a lag time of an hour, but the particles that are uh, one, two, three microns in diameter are going to penetrate. Uh, but that's very different than the deposition of massive amounts of condensing SVOCs that are that are odorous and are going to create problems in a structural fire. So it's a completely different thing. When we talk about health effects, you know, other than the Fort McMurray study that I think so far is the best, this University of Toronto work that is the best that I've seen looking at the concentrations of metals and uh, PAHs that are present after a wildfire, there's not any really good data to support that this is a health concern. So, you know, I'd like to see that data. I mean, there's a lot of expression of this is a potential concern and this and that. If you look at the AIHA document, it's brought out as a potential concern, but there's no references to why these are these are health effects. So, you know, I think this is something we need to continue to investigate, but there isn't a lot of evidence to show that there's health effects associated with the deposition of this particulate. One of the things that the Toronto study uh, demonstrated was that uh, long-term accumulation of PAHs from vehicles and other sources uh, can overwhelm what you might have 
from a relatively brief exposure to wildfire emissions. And, uh, uh, you know, I've worked a number of cases where they've taken samples inside wall cavities. A lot of the debris that's there has accumulated over time and uh, is not related to the particular fire of interest. Yeah, in particular, if it's an old house and they had a coal burning fireplace and, you know, uh, different types of construction and so on and so forth. Absolutely. You know, that I, I think that there's still a lot of ambiguity here. I, I want to read one of the, why would anyone not want to know the analytics of cleaning before and after? Why would anyone trust a sponge instead of the IH in the lab? From what I'm seeing, there isn't scientific um, consensus on the best way to test before and after. Is that would you say that's somewhat accurate to say? Well, there are a number of ways of testing. Uh, you know, there's the situation that Cliff brought up where you walk into the environment and it's just obvious. Uh, if the home has been exposed to uh, a wildfire, you would expect uh, an increase in the amount of black particulate. And a lot of these labs are just looking at black particulate. Hopefully they're using dark field reflected light so they know the particle is actually black and not just opaque. Uh, so, uh, you know, that kind of analysis uh, still has value. Uh, the next step up is where they actually look at it and, and you know, identify grass fragments, charred grass fragments and that kind of thing. And that's another step up that's fairly easy, but unfortunately, nobody's training people to do that until now. The, uh, uh, you know, there are times when uh, an analysis tells you something that's really important. And, uh, uh, you know, if you walk into an environment, let me give you an example. I recently read an article where they were talking about, they were identifying wildfire particles. Uh, they found char, but they didn't find any ash. That's impossible. Ash is a major component of wildfires. And so if the lab can't see ash, whatever it is they're looking at, it's not wildfire. Uh, with a little training, perhaps their microscopist could identify the ash. <laughs> but uh, uh, there's a lot of data out there uh, that unfortunately uh, is not very good because of the analysis that was performed on it. And uh, so sometimes the data that's out there, we, we need to kind of be cautious in interpreting it. Brad, is there anything you'd like to add before we, we wrap this up? We're getting real close to the end. You know, I, I, it would have been great if we could have described all of the techniques uh, that Russ uses to do the assemblage analysis and shown pictures of all of that uh, and all of the clues that exist in these slides uh, from the deposited particulate. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, there's really nothing more to add other than to say, you know, as far as uh, good occupational hygiene tools, particle analysis using light microscopy is incredibly undervalued. And there's a lot of information we could derive, not just for bushfire and wildfire, but for all kinds of indoor air quality problems. Uh, it's a really powerful tool when it's used properly. And, and I hope that, that we can you know, develop more expertise and people can incorporate it more into their practice. I appreciate that. Cliff, before we go, any final thoughts or questions? Yeah, I, I, I think a couple final thoughts. I think number one is, um, you know, in, in any building that's had a fire, uh, we generally don't have any idea of what was there before, of what was present in, in, in that particular environment. So we have no idea of what the baseline is. 
And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I have some concerns about testing after a fire because everything that was in there, you know, uh, public adjusters and other people, uh, you know, are going to take advantage of that particular scenario and say, none of this stuff was in there before. And I think we all realize that if you look at any of our homes really, really closely, we're going to find all sorts of hazardous issues. And and really, the you know, the dose makes the poison, as Brad had said before. And, you know, the fact that there's something there in a, in a, in a trace level, I'm not sure that you have to get the homeowner all upset about it, particularly when there's a high probability that some or more of it was you know, was, was was there before. So I'm not anti-testing. Uh, I, I think there's a place for it. And I think Brad described where the place is, you know, in the event that there's uh, ambiguity and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, I've certainly utilized it uh, myself. I think in the future, I'll be using a different person to do that <laughs> uh, <laughs> in any event. But, uh, uh, you know, so I, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I think that's one issue. And I think the second is really the importance of cleaning. You know, cleaning has been proven, uh, you know, time after time to remove many hazardous materials. Uh, you know, di dioxins and furans and so on and so forth have been successfully removed, you know, with detergents and water. So uh, I, I think that's important. And, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, over the... 50 some years that, that and I've been playing around in this industry. I, I mean, I can tell you, I've never left a fire damage site worse than it was before I got there. You know, typically uh, it's, it's significantly improved. And uh, I, I, it would seem to me that if we were leaving a lot of hazards in the house, that we would kind of know it by now, you know, there's just been, you know, the insurance industry, uh, uh, you know, I think that they, they kind of know what the issues are. And I think restoration people know what the issues are as well. So, I just thank both of you gentlemen for coming and uh, you know chatting with us today and giving us your opinions. And I think we'll have you back sooner than later. Well, let's, Brad, let me give you the last, any final thoughts or comments? Uh, not really. Not really. I, I think we kind of covered us. it. There's been as much, uh, discussion on the chat as we've ever had so this is definitely an, a topic of interest and russ one more time any final thoughts or questions or comments from you well just uh you know we're hoping to get a lot of people trained to know how to do this you know we're going to put all this in cliff's blog we'll include a lot of the links and the papers etc and of course if you wanted to continue the discussion go to afterthoughts.com I dot com at IAQ radio. I'll get that right here. Let me get let me make sure I get the right one on here. It is afterthoughts.iaqradio.com. Thanks so much for joining us this week. Next week, we've got Mark Springer back. We're looking forward to a great discussion with Mark uh, as he moves on as past president of the Restoration Industry Association. I'm sure he'll have a lot of things to say about this topic as well. I want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick, Grayson, Gone Fish and Fisher at the controls. Most importantly, our wonderful uh, audience and, of course, our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. We'll be back next Friday at noon with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening.